The title of today's message is God's Incredible Grace, Part 1. And Before we get started, I, I want to take care of an issue that arose last week when I was making the point that even when interpreting scriptures literally, which is uh, the way that I believe it should be interpreted when at all possible, even when we're interpreting scriptures literally, we need to exercise care. Uh, that we don't make the scriptures say something other than what they're trying to say, that what they're intended to say. I used Christ's words in Matthew 24, verse 2 as an example, when he said, Truly I say to you, not one stone here shall be left upon another which will not be torn down. I went on to talk about the great foundation stones that are clearly one atop the other. Or the wailing wall. Uh, which dates back to the time of Christ. And clearly those stones are one upon another. I said uh, that what Christ was saying, that the temple was completely and utterly destroyed as to its functionality. Now, um, since then, I've had uh, uh, a couple people question that. And uh, I'm really not going to defend it, <laughs> because that wasn't the point I was making. I mean, I, w I wanted to make the point that we need to be careful when we're uh, interpreting Scripture. We need to compare Scripture with other Scripture. Uh, so I'm going to leave that one kind of hanging, but I'm going to use another example then. Let's look at Matthew 21, and Pastor Dan spoke about this uh, a few weeks back. 21, 18 through 20. Now, in the morning, when he returned to the city, he became hungry. And seeing a lone fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it except leaves only. And he said to it, No longer shall there ever be any fruit from you. And at once the fig tree withered. And seeing this, the disciples marveled, saying, How did the fig tree wither at once? If that was the only record we had of that event, it would be pretty straightforward. Uh, the uh, crux of the matter is, what does it mean at once? Let's look at Mark 11, 12. Now this is a... A parallel account of that, it's an account of the same event. Matthew, Mark. Mark 11, 12. On the next day, when they had departed from Bethany, he became hungry. And seeing at a distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to see if perhaps he would find anything on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he answered and said to it, May no one ever eat fit fruit from you again. And his disciples were listening. Then uh, he goes into the temple in the verses following. He casts out those who were buying and selling in the temple. He overturns the tables of the money changers in the seats of those who were selling doves, he would not permit anyone to carry goods through the temple. Amazing to me that people were using the temple as a shortcut to carry goods through. After this, when evening came, they, w they went out of the city. And uh, returning in the morning, and as they, in verse 20, as they were passing by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots up. And being reminded, Peter said to him, Rabbi, the fig tree which you cursed has withered. That's funny. Part of it's my voice, I think. I, 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 I can't. Sorry. <laughs> so, in the first account, 
He said, immediately, immediately, the tree withered. What does immediate mean? By comparing scripture with scripture, we learn that immediate was not instantaneous. We learned that immediate was, well, they, they noticed the next day that it was withered from the roots up. Certainly miraculous and certainly immediate, depending on how you want to. Uh, I mean, if I walked up to a big tree on your property and said, be a curse, and the next day you walked out there and it was dead in a doornail, you would, you would say, wow. That was, <laughs> yeah, that was immediate. Um, so uh, we just need to be careful how we use words. We don't want to draw real hard lines. The tree was destroyed as to its functionality, just as the temple was destroyed as its functionality. Okay, let's open in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you that this, despite uh, illnesses, that uh, you are good, that, that we can gather to praise you, that we can find comfort in you for uh, what we need to do in life. And Lord, we thank you for your word, which uh, gives us hope to the future. As in looking no place else can we find the kind of hope that we find in this scripture. Uh, Lord, uh, be with our... Be with me as I read your words today. Uh, be with the hearers. Uh, help us to, uh, to uh, get from these passages uh, life-changing life -changing thoughts. If we want to draw more near to you. We want to honor you with the way that we live our lives day by day. So give us strength and give us courage. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, we concluded our reading in Matthew 24 last week at verse 8. We'll just look there again real quick. Matthew 24, verse 8. Remember, he said, but all these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. All of what things? Well, Christ had given us several signs. Uh, nation rise, wars all over the place, uh, famines, earthquakes. Uh, in other passages, there are more signs. Um, the point is that these signs uh, were to increase like birth pangs as, as we neared the uh, advent of Christ, the second advent. Now, I mentioned in passing last week that the U.S. Geological Survey has said that uh, the incidence of powerful earthquakes is on a dramatic, dramatic rise. Uh, they have a chart the U.S. Geological Survey puts out that shows the incidence of heavy er um, five and above earthquakes. And it just, the chart goes like this for decade after decade after decade. And then it starts an upward slope. And, and today, if you go to this, it's about like this. I mean, it's almost straight up. Um, does that mean the Lord is coming next Tuesday? No. Wednesday. Okay, I'm for Wednesday. Uh, no, it doesn't, but it means, very well could mean that we're getting closer, that we should be. Christ said, when you see these things happen, look up. In, in Luke, in the parallel passage, he says, when you see these things happen, look up. Salvation is drawing near. Um, wars and rumors of war, you know we've always had wars. We mentioned that last week. Um, recently, I heard that there's more wars going on right now than ever in history. Have you heard? The news is saying that there's more people in slavery today than at any time in history. 
These things are increasing. These horrible things are increasing in intensity and frequency. The earthquakes, the wars. Um, I had Paul print off some stuff to me for, that uh, has appeared on the news in the last week. Uh, ABC News uh, talking about the, um, the um, New Madrid fault line, which goes through the Midwest. Uh, the U.S. Geological Survey is telling the government to get ready. We've got to be putting the resources aside. This thing's going to pop. You know, when this thing went last time, there was no, very little population in the area. Uh, now there are millions upon millions of people in this, uh, in this area. Homeland Security uh, says that this will be, uh, that this could be, uh, boy, if I could find the words, I didn't underline it, unfortunately. It's going to lead to catastrophic loss of life. I don't want to uh, make this kind of a scary thing. Uh, the, what I'm trying to show you is that uh, you can, there are many places we can look and see that, uh, that problems are developing for this earth. Do you truly believe, for instance, that this world on its present course of nuclear proliferation, more and more deadly weapons falling, in, falling into the hands of terrorist organizations, etc. Do you believe that it has a long, peaceful, and prosperous future? Yeah. In my opinion, if you believe that, you're living in serious de denial. I think we can see that things are kind of coming to a head. Now, that does not mean that it can't settle out that there can't be revival, that ca people can't turn to the Lord and this thing go on and on and on. I'm not saying that it can't. But I'm saying, Jesus said, when you see these things increasing in frequency and intensity, look up. I'm near. So, I'm wanting us to look up. Now, that's an interesting beginning to a message entitled God's Incredible Grace, don't you think? Uh, actually, I'm calling it God's Incredible Grace Part 1 and because there's not going to be a whole lot of grace in it today. Uh, just some interesting information. Okay. I wanted to read Faith Walkers, yesterday's Faith Walkers. I hope you're reading these things. Uh, they're wonderful, I believe. Here's, here was Saturdays. Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on the count of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out. This is by Josh Whitney. Jesus, as the source, the sustainer, and the sovereign, helps us with fear. Put yourself in that moment when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Imagine if you were Mary or Martha. What an overwhelming sense of security would sweep through you. Imagine thinking, Jesus is in control of life and death, and he's my friend. Whatever happens to us, I know he can handle it because I saw him raise my brother from the dead. Isn't that an interesting take on that? Are you consumed with fear today? Maybe you have fears about the direction our country is heading. Maybe you have fears about your financial situation. Maybe you are fearful and anxious about how you're going to pay your medical bills or your debt. Maybe your job is uncertain or you are fearful for the health of your child. Maybe your family is in a mess or you fear you will always be single. Imagine yourself again at Lazarus' graveside. There's peace there. I'm with that guy. 
He just told a dead guy to come back to life, and he did. 37 trillion cells in his body were fixed. I mean, Lazarus had been in that grave for four days. His, his body was, those cells were just going to pieces. And yet, uh, out he comes. If we let our fears consume us, we are saying, you have no power here, Jesus. I can't trust your goodness in the midst of this situation. The God who raises people from the dead can help you in your life. And the God who raised people from the dead uh, can give us peace and comfort in the midst of a discussion like this where we are uh, kind of taking a look at more of a negative side of, of what's going on in the planet. Now, beginning in Matthew 24, verse 9, We're going to be reading about uh, prophecies relating to a seven-year period of time known uh, variously as uh, the tribulation, time of uh, Jacob's trouble, and the great tribulation as well fits in there. If you read the parallel passages in Luke 21, you will see that these prophecies have some near fulfillments in the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. You'll also see that there's some far fulfillments uh, uh, at the last seven years of our current history of man. So let's read 9 through 14. Then they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you and you will be hated by all nations on account of my name. And at that time, many will fall away and will del deliver up one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and will mislead many. And because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end, he shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached to the whole world for a witness to all the nations, and then the end shall come. And that brings us to verse 15. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the leader understand. Ah, that's an interesting phrase, isn't it? Uh, what does that mean? Well, he says Daniel talks about it, so let's turn to Daniel 9, 26 and 27. Daniel 9. 26 and 27. This is in a section where he's, where he's uh, saying that there's uh, 70 weeks or 70 times 7 or 490 years uh, left for the uh, people of Israel. And then he talks about going to uh, after 69 weeks Well, yeah. We get up to the 69th week, and then there's one more week left. And he, these are weeks of years. So we're in the last seven years now. Uh, then after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. And its end will come with a flood. Even to the end, there will be war. Desolations are determined. And he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. And on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate, even until a complete destruction, one that is decreed, is poured out on the one who makes desolate. So we've got uh, this character, whoever he is, he calls him... Uh, in verse 26, uh, the prince who is to come. 
he's going to, uh, in the middle of the week, at the, at the three and a half year period of the tribulation, he's going to put a stop to sacrifice and grain offerings. What does that tell us about the end times? If, we, if we're going to look at this verse with any kind of, uh, try to interpret with any kind of literacy, if that's a word, uh, there's got to be a temple in existence. Now, I'll, I realize that a lot of people uh, do not believe that there's going to be a temple, but uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. Let's get some more insight into what's going on here, because this is a difficult verse, okay, a difficult passage. Let's look at 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, and 4. Find out more, interest, more information about this character that is so, uh, this prince who in the middle at the three and a half year period in the tribulation uh, desecrates the altar, becomes an abomination. Second Thessalonians 2, 3 and 4. Hmm. I've got, I'm in 1 Thessalonians. That's why I'm not seeing what I was got, expected. 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 and 4. Let no one in any way deceive you, for it, it will not come. And that is the Lord's visible coming. Uh, I should have read the verse before. I'm going to just start at the first beginning of the chapter. Now, we request, we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you may not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as if it from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one in any way deceive you, for that will not come, the day of the Lord will not come, unless the apostasy comes first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. So, um, this prince, who is to come at some later date, he may be on the planet right now, uh, is going to... If we had read more in Daniel, we, we see that he's going to make a treaty with uh, Israel. It's kind of going to bring peace to the I area. Wouldn't it be great to have peace in the Mideast? Well, this guy's going to do it. Except for that in the middle of his uh, seven-year treaty, uh, he's going to uh, break faith with Israel, and he's going to go into the temple and declare himself God in the temple. That's in uh, uh, Thessalonians that we just read. Now, critics of what I, the interpretation I just gave you, uh, critics of taking these verses literally insist there will not be another temple. There will not be a thousand year kingdom ruled over by Christ on this earth. And by this position, in my mind, uh, they make hundreds and hundreds of verses in this Bible of no effect. Let me, let's just take a look at, at what we're reducing some of our scripture to by taking that view. I want you to turn with me to uh, Ezekiel. We'll start in, uh, let's look at, uh, well, we can pick it up. From Ezekiel, from the 38th chapter to the end of the book, is talking about this temple. So, we'll just uh, start reading anywhere. Um, in, oh, we're going to begin with 40, I'm sorry. Not 38. Let's go 45. Just start reading there. And we can start reading anywhere in these last eight uh, verses. 
Verse 5, 40, verse 5. And behold, there was a wall on the outside of the temple all around, and in the man's hand was a measuring rod of six cubits, each of which was a cubit and a handbreadth. So he measured the thickness of the wall, one rod, and the height, one rod. Then he went to the gate, which faced east, went up its steps and measured the threshold of the gate, one rod in width, and the other threshold, which was one rod in, in width. Uh, why am I reading this? It's the most boring eight chapters in this Bible. My question is, what does it mean? If you don't want to take the words literally, how do you get any meaning out of that? And I would guess, if you're not going to take these words literally, then what does it mean that it's a rod from this point to this point? And then from this point to this point, it's a rod. Then he brought me into the outer chamber, and behold, there were chambers and a pavement made for the court all around. Thirty chambers faced the pavement. What spiritual insight do you get from that by attempting to interpret these verses spiritually or figuratively? I think these verses only make sense as we interpret the scripture it's saying what it's saying. There's going to be a temple, and this is going to be its structure and its dimensions. It's very important, I think, to, uh, to under, in understanding end times prophecies, I think it's very important to understand that Israel plays a big point, part in it. I've had numerous guys tell me that the fact that there's a nation of Israel over there is a complete accident of history. It has nothing to do with uh, prophecy. And I have a hard time swallowing that. Because here's a nation of people that God said, I'm going to throw you, and if you disobey me, I'm going to throw you into all the nations of the earth. And they're going to grind you down in those nations. But I'm not going to give up on you. And in the latter days, I'm going to bring you back. Now, we developed in the early church, and you can see it in the writings of guys like Marcion. I think he was writing in the 400s. Marcion? I think that's how you pronounce his name. There was a, um, they were really trying to break the church away from anything from its roots in Judaism. And it's uh, kind of hard to see taking that line when you read Paul in Romans, where he says, hey, we don't support Israel. the Jews. They support us. Christianity is supported by Judaism. And uh, he says, don't get high horse thinking, hey, God really loves us. Because he said, uh, he says in that passage that, God is going to uh, bring the Jews back in. So, if we're not going to interpret this literally, I would bet you that if you put 300 men on the task of telling what this means spiritually, you'd get 300 different answers. Some passages you can read and, and uh, say, wow, that's neat. Uh, I can spiritualize that. As a matter of fact, Paul does that when he talks about uh, Hagar and Sarah and, and Hagar standing for, uh, you know, the law, Sarah standing for the promise. Uh, but when Paul does it, I'm okay with that because that's under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Um, and I see a lot of... Uh, good teaching that way. I've heard a lot of good teaching over the years. But uh, the fact is that all those things happened the way it said they happened in the Old Testament. And when we're reading this, these large sections about the temple at the end times, we are we're reading about something that's real. Um, there will be a 1,000-year kingdom ruled over by Christ on this earth. And uh, 
if you don't accept that, um, God isn't going to be mad at you. You're just going to be wrong. That's all. <laughs> so, let's go back to Matthew 24. We've got the Antichrist, and that's what Paul calls him, uh, standing in the temple, declaring himself to be God. Matthew 24. Picking it up then at verse 16. Then let those who are in Jude Judah flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go up, go down to get the things out that are in his house. And let him who is in the field not return back to get his cloak. But woe to those who are with child and to those who nurse babes in those days. But pray that your flight may not be in the winter or on a Sabbath. What do we got going here? We've got uh, the Antichrist declaring himself to be God in the temple at the three and a half year mark. And Jesus is telling the people, when you see that, head for the hills. Because things are about to get really, really tough. Uh, now, Matthew 25 and 26 here focuses on Israel. If you notice, the uh, context of the whole, this whole passage here was Israel. Uh, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Uh, pray your flight may not be on the winter or on a Sabbath. Um, Many in the early church uh, did not care for the fact that this ha is in a Jewish context. And I think that's part of the reason why this stuff is spiritualized or else forced, all of it is forced up to uh, the destruction of the temple in AD 70 and in the, in the fall of Jerusalem. But this doesn't make sense. I mean, we're leaving too much out of the narrative if we try to force everything into something that's happened in history. These things are obviously talking about the end times because they're talking about the second coming of Christ. Okay, verse 21 and 22. For then there will be a great tribulation such has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now nor ever shall. And unless those days had been cut short, no life would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Now Christ in Matthew here does not go into the details of the terrors that constitute this great tribulation. But he has his servant John go very much into detail. And that's in the book of Revelation concerning these horrors. Uh, the revelation of Jesus Christ, the last book in our Bible, is, detail, is more detailed than you want sometimes about the uh, terrible things that are going to be going on in planet Earth. A couple things to note. It is so bad that if Christ doesn't intervene in history at that point, there will be no life left on the planet. That's what it says. And what, what does that mean? I think it means that if Christ doesn't intervene, at this place, point in history, there won't be any life left. I think it, it means exactly what it says. Then, moving on. If anyone says to you, behold, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe him. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. So you've got this mess going on. The world is in turmoil. And uh, during this time, you've got all these uh, false prophets and false Christs showing up. And they're able to do great signs or wonders. Now, whether or not those are satanically inspired, actual spiritual occurrences, or if, if it's trickery, I don't know. It's not important. The important thing is, you don't listen to those people. Behold, I have told you in advance. If therefore they say to you, Behold, he is in the wilderness, do not go forth. 
or behold, he is in the inner rooms. Do not believe them. Because here's the truth of it. For just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Uh, it will be impossible to miss. During this period of time, people will be trying, there will be evil folks trying to deceive people about Christ. Oh, come to our meeting. He's there. We're gonna, he's coming. He's going to appear to us. Uh, no, the second coming of Christ is going to be a thing impossible to miss. And then there's a curious little verse after that. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. Uh, that's a passage that uh, shows up in the Old Testament a few times. And what it is referring to is the terrible destruction of life that occurs at the second coming. The reason there's this, 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 there's this destruction of life is that man, it, it doesn't tell it here, but in other passages, men are going to fight Christ for domination of this earth. It doesn't seem like a very intelligent thing to do, but it results in terrible bloodshed. Okay, 29 and 30. This is the main event. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and all the tribes of earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. That's the main event. He's coming. Um, all the tribes of the earth will mourn, it says. Now, some of that mourning is, oh no, we're not going to get to do it our way anymore. He's taken over. Some of that mourning is, and we read this in Zechariah, the 12th chapter. Oh no, I was wrong. They were mourning for their spiritual condition. And, and those people, it's a good thing. For the others, it's the end. It's doom. 31. You know what? Uh, it, well, let's read 31. He will send forth his angels with a great trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of the sky to the other. Now, when we think of trumpets, we think of these brass things. Uh, what they actually, it'll sound more like is, can you try to do that for us? Except cooler. <laughs> yeah. You know, when you're under pressure, there we go. There we go. That's, that's what a trumpet sounds like in the Bible. Uh, now, guys have been playing those all their lives, some of these old Levites. It's pretty impressive sound. And uh, so the angels go out and they gather together his elect from the four winds. You know, um, an author I've read a few books by, he's a CNN journalist and he's stationed in Jerusalem where he was. I don't even know if he's still, because I've been reading him for a lot of years. He might be gone now. I don't know. Uh, oh, and I think he writes in Israel My Glory. At least there's a guy with the same name that writes articles in Israel My Glory. Well, his name is Dolan. And in one of the books I read, he said, I was pre-millennial or pre-trib. In other words, I used to teach that, which is what I'm teaching right now, that uh, Christ would come for the church prior to this awful tribulation that occurs. But he said, reading this verse, I realize now 
that it's at the end of the tribulation. So the church is going to go through the tribulation. And if, if this is talking about the rapture of the church, well, then he's absolutely right, isn't it? Because we've got all this trouble, we've got, we've got the, uh, this great war and tribulation going on to the point where if God didn't step in, there wouldn't be a living soul left on the planet. And then after all of that, he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. Well, Dolan, I appreciated his uh, respect for scripture, but he needed to know a little more scripture. And uh, we're going to look at, uh, we're going to look at some of those scriptures. It's taught throughout the Old Testament that when the Messiah comes at the end of the, of the days, that he will gather all the believing Jews into Israel and Jerusalem as their capital. Now let's look real quick. Uh, we're going to look at just a few verses. We're going to look at uh, Deuteronomy. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy 30. This is Moses talking, by the way. And Moses is predicting. And Moses predicted, if we read prior to this, he, he predicts that there's going to be two times in the, in the life of Israel, the nation, that they, because of their unbelief, because they won't obey the Lord, they're not interested in him, he's going to send them into captivity. Once, it's going to be a short captivity. It's going to last 70 years. He doesn't name the, the length. He just said it uh, short. So, and that, of course, was the uh, captivity in the Babylon, which lasted 70 years. And, but he says, and there's a second one, which is of long duration, and that it's going to be in all, into all the nations of the earth. So that's where we're coming to. Uh, so, it, so it shall be when all these things have come upon you, the blessings and the curse which I have set before you, and you call them to mind in all the nations where the Lord your God has banished you. And you return to the Lord your God and obey him with your heart and soul according to all that I've commanded you today, you and your sons. Then the Lord your God will restore you from captivity and have compassion on you and will gather you again from all the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you. If your out outcasts are at the ends of the earth, from there the Lord your God will gather you, and from there he will bring you back. And the Lord your God will bring you into the land which your fathers possessed, and you shall possess it, and he shall prosper you and multiply you more than your fathers. Uh, so this is, Moses is saying that after the Jews have been dispersed into all the nations of the world, they're going to turn to him. Now, they haven't yet. Israel is a, not a Christian nation. It's, it's, a, it's a nation that still follows the, uh, uh, the religion of Judaism. And, uh, but the things that sound so terrible to us, which well, they are terrible, by the way, and that is the tribulation, which is sometimes called the uh, time of Jacob's trouble, it has an effect on all these people who are scattered into all the nations of the earth. It, the persecution becomes horrible. And they say, whoop. And they start looking at their scriptures and they say, we missed them. And then they begin to realize who it was. And Zechariah, uh, 12th chapter, says that when the Lord comes, to, he finds them mourning over their spiritual condition. In other words, they're repentant and they're, they're ready to accept him. And so then at some time, then he's, at some time it, he's going to be bringing them all back into this nation. And I think that's what you know, this uh, passage in 31, in 
20, Matthew 24, 31 is talking about. But let's look at, at uh, First Chronicles. We'll hear that same type of story again. 16, 30, uh, 33 to 35. Then let the trees of the forest will sing. Then the trees of the forest will sing for joy before the Lord. For he is coming to judge the earth. So we've established the time frame. It's when the Lord is coming to judge the earth. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Then say, Save us, O God, of our salvation, and gather us and deliver us from the nations to give thanks to your holy name and glory in thy praise. Uh, so we have a, we're talking about a period of time in the future when God is coming back to judge, when Christ is coming to judge the earth and then he brings the Jews back. Another verse, real quick. I, I hope I'm not spending too much time on this, but it's kind of important. Uh, Isaiah, 11th chapter, uh, 11 and 12. Then it will happen on that day that the Lord will again recover the second time with his hand the remnant of his people who will remain. From Assyria, Egypt, Pathros, Cush, Elam, Shiner, Hamath, and from the islands of the sea. And he will lift up a standard for the nations and will assemble the banished ones of Israel and will gather the dispersed of Israel from the four corners of the earth, from the north, south, east, and west. Our uh, passage in the uh, 31st verse in 24 Matthew, uh, he will elect from the he will gather his elect from the four winds, north, south, east, and west. I believe we're talking about the identical thing here. So that this verse is not talking about Christ coming for his church, which occurs prior to the tribulation, but he's talking about Christ's return and then regathering all the Jews that are in, dispersed into all the nations of the world into Israel and, and Jerusalem. <coughs> Isaiah 43. I'm going to get off this horse in a minute, but I just want to uh, bring a couple more up here. Isaiah 43, 5 through 7. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east, gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth, everyone who is called by my name and whom I have created for my glory, whom I have formed even whom I have made. Uh, he's talking to uh, Israel. Uh, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. And uh, he's telling them that he's, he's going to be bringing these people back at the end. From the north, south, east, and west. Isaiah 66, 20. I want to finish with that. That's the last one of these I'll do. But I want, to get, I want you to understand that it is taught throughout the Old Testament. A... A rapture type thing where God goes and he gathers his people from from the utmost parts of the earth from the north the south and east and the west uh, Isaiah 66 20 then it, this is we're uh, we've got the second coming this Isaiah 66 is all about that then they shall bring your brethren from all the nations as a grain offering to the Lord on horses in chariots in litters, on mules, on camels, to my holy mountain Jerusalem, says the Lord, just as the sons of Israel bring their grain offering in a clean vessel to the house of the Lord. Uh, then I will take some for priests and for Levites, says the Lord. Again, showing that at that time there's going to be a temple and temple worship. So, Dolan a wonderful writer, and if you see his books, you will enjoy them, guaranteed. But he didn't understand that there would be an end gathering of the Jews at the end. So, that led me to kind of think, uh, let's talk a little bit about the rapture of the church compared to the end gathering of the Jews. Uh, the rapture of the church 
Let's look at First uh, Thessalonians, fourth chapter, verses 16 through 18. First Thessalonians, fourth chapter, verses 16 to 18. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, uh, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus shall we always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. So the Lord himself will descend. And the dead in Christ will rise and then we who are alive and remain will also be caught up with them in the clouds to meet the Lord with the air, in the air and thus shall we always be with the Lord. Uh, in, uh, in the passage you read in the 24th chapter, verse 31 of Matthew, uh, he sends his angels out to bring these people in from all the nations of the earth where he's uh, spread them out to. But uh, the rapture, it's the Lord himself comes, and we meet him in the air. He also says this in John 14. That's a verse which I know a lot of people can quote. I'm not going to trust myself to quote it. I'm not trusting myself to quote any of these. I'm not too sharp today. But I'm going to read it. Uh, John chapter 14, verse, uh, well, I'll just start with one. Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So in the rapture, we meet Christ in the air and we go to a place that he has gone to prepare for us. In, the, in all these Old Testament passages concerning Israel, they are in gathered from all the nations of the world into Jerusalem and Israel. Another difference or comparison contrast. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15. This is one a very familiar passage. Wonderful passage. 1 Corinthians 15. And we're going to start reading in verse 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable, this mortal must put on the immortality. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Uh, what I want us to notice here that when Christ comes for the church, it's instant, there's an instantaneous event. Uh, the scripture says, um, in the twinkling of an eye, the actual, the actual literal um, Greek word for this little tiny space of time is atmos which is where we get our word atom atom it's an atom of time this all occurs in so it's instantaneous compare that contrast that with um, with what we read in Isaiah 66 verse 20 when it says he's going to send out his angels, his helpers, he's going to gather them and they're going to be coming in on camels, mules, litters. This will take weeks, months, years. Because remember, the state of the, the earth is in. It's just survived a devastating war where if Christ did not come in there and stop it, there would be no life left on earth. The earth has, devast has just survived, just came through a series of devastating earthquakes 
where the scripture says all the major cities of the world are, are leveled. Uh, it's not like you'll be able to go to the travel. If you live in, uh, I don't know, uh, Australia, in Perth, it's not like you're going to be able to go to the airport. Well, call a taxi. Well, we don't have taxis. There's no roads. This place is destroyed. Uh, how long it'll take uh, Christ to put the world back together, I don't know. But I do know that these people that are coming in to Jerusalem from all these uh, uh, diverse parts of the earth, it's going to take them a very, very long time to get there. It's not instantaneous, which is what happens to the believer who's raptured uh, to be with Christ. Uh, these guys are coming to Jerusalem to meet Christ in Jerusalem where he is reigning as king. Um, First Corinthians, when Christ comes for the church, we also saw this in the passage we read, 51 to 54, but we'll just read 50 this time. Um, now I say this, brethren, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. When Christ comes for the church, uh, the scripture says that uh, we are changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. That this perishable has to put on imperishable. This mortal has to put on immortality. We can't exist in a perfect kingdom in our present bodies. Okay, compare that, contrast that with Israel. The kingdom of Israel, mortal. They are mortals because the scripture talks about them dying. It says in Isaiah that if a man dies as a, at a hundred, he will be thought of as having died as a child. There's going to be long, people are going to be very long lived in the kingdom and uh, for that thousand year period. And, and it appears that some of them will live the whole thing, possibly most of them. But death is present. Also, at the beginning of that kingdom, the Bible says that the population, God says, I'm going to make man rare on the face of the earth. The population of the planet is very much reduced. Because during the tribulation, at one event, a third of the, uh, a third of the uh, population of the planet dies. At another event, a fourth of the population of the planet dies. And that's not in including uh, uh, everything else that's going on, the hailstones that uh, the scripture says weigh 160 pounds that's going to be falling on the earth at various times. Uh, so there's going to be tremendous loss of life. And then when Christ comes, and we're going to see that in the next chapter, in, in chapter 25, what he does, he brings people before him and those that believe in him that have accepted his right to rule they go into the kingdom those that don't that are not his they go uh, to the unpleasant place to hell so you've got an you've got an incredibly reduced population and then there's the judgment on that that it reduces it incredibly even more so, God says, I will make man rare on the face of the earth, rare as the gold of Orpher. Orpher is a gold field. He, God did not say, I will make man as rare as gold. He said, I will make man as rare as gold from one gold field. Uh, the population of your earth is going to be very small at the beginning but we read that by the end of it it's huge the population is huge so these people are yes there is there is death but uh, these are mortal people they are having kids and they've got a thousand years where there's very little death so the population just explodes so in the 
Rapture of the church, immortal. The ingathering of the Jews at the end, they're mortal. Death is present. They're married. They, they marry. They have children. Um, we've learned in the, that verses we read, uh, the rapture verses, the rapture for the church, that uh, our state is eternal at that point. Thus shall we ever be with the Lord. However, uh, Revelation 20, chapter 6, verse says that this kingdom is going to last for a definite period of time. It says 1,000 years. But there's going to be, this kingdom is not eternal. Those people are mortals, and they won't become immortal until the end of that, uh, end of that uh, kingdom period when they either accept Christ and go to heaven and join us or they reject and some unbelievably many unbelievably do uh, reject them and they go to hell all right another factor of the uh, rapture of the church when Christ comes back for the believers is that includes all nationalities people of every nation and and time and tongue all of our brothers and sisters all through history who be died believing in Christ their hope was in the Lord they're all going to be raised at the rapture of the church in the kingdom of Israel only the Jews are brought in to Israel and uh, Jerusalem the scripture says there won't be any Jews outside of Israel. They're all brought back. Every believing Jew on the face of this planet will be living in Israel and Jerusalem. Whereas the, um, the believing uh, Gentiles that are alive at that time, you know, they'll be spread in the various nations. There still, there still will be nations. So, uh, you know why I entitled this message God's Incredible Grace Part 1 because we didn't hear a thing about God's Incredible Grace <laughs> that comes in Part 2 that awaits next week uh, if the Lord tarries <laughs> I'm looking forward to it let's hear some good news Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.